you are looking at live pictures from Soweto, South Africa, at the state memorial service for former President Nelson Mandela. It's been raining there all morning long, but the mood can only be described as jubilant. World leaders and tens of thousands of South Africans have come to pay their respects to a man who helped free his country from the chains of apartheid. Many have been struck by the outpouring of emotion, not just mourning, but celebrations and dancing. The joy is said to be infectious inside the stadium, and it's fitting the service is being held at FNB Stadium. It's where Mandela made his final public appearance at the 2010 World Cup. The memorial has been underway for about two hours. It includes tributes from his grandchildren and world leaders, including President Obama, who was just seen and applauded by the crowd. We're going to take the president's comments in full as soon as they happen. And good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, December 10th. Welcome to Morning Joe. We're going to be following the funeral memorial services all morning long. With us on set, we have the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton, joining us this morning. MSNBC political analyst and visiting professor at NYU, former Democratic Congressman Harold Ford Jr. And in Washington, correspondent for Bloomberg, Juliana Goldman. We have a big show today. Actor Idris Elba, who starred in the new film Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, will be with us later. Uh, we're going to get to other news in just a moment, but first, Reverend Al, uh, you've been watching the services. I have as well. Um, beautiful in many ways. It's beautiful, and, and it's a real tribute that we probably won't see uh, the likes of in our lifetime. To see people gather heads of states from around the world, world figures, uh, people of all denominations and religions, and to come right there to Soweto. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this stadium is right at the edge of Soweto, and, and I was in South Africa as an election observer in 94, so I went to Soweto, and it's unimaginable for those that came even way before I uh, got involved, for Soweto, which was the black township, mm -hmm. to host this, but then it is so befitting, because that's what Mandela did, is open up South Africa to the world, and to democracy, so it is It is a fitting tribute that is unprecedented. Very symbolic, and Willie Geist, it's amazing how they've pulled this together oh. so quickly. Security concerns across the board. Um, at the same time, uh, the mood there so joyful and so peaceful. Uh, world leaders from all over, all around the earth have uh, descended upon Soweto. We have uh, pre former presidents and President Obama who we're waiting on right now, but what a production to make it happen. All you can think of as you watch this is what a life, what yeah. a life. You know, know, it was only 40 years ago that that country, South Africa, put him in prison for who he was and what he believed and what he spoke about. And now, less than 40 years later, there's an overflowing stadium full of people, both black and white, cheering him, celebrating his life. Mm. It's an incredible statement about who he is and an incredible statement about where that country has gone in the last half century. And Juliana, to the point of security concerns, uh, the White House probably scrambling to make it all happen. Yep, the White House, certainly not a, uh, a cake run for the Secret Service here, Mika. But look, I think there's some 90, some uh, world leaders uh, who are joining uh, the, the ceremony today compared to 70 with the Pope's funeral. So mm. a lot had to scramble to come together, having to coordinate airspace, motorcades. Uh, it's, it's really just uh, a, a dance, and it's, it has to be choreographed quite smoothly and obviously we're seeing just with the delays uh, the president only arriving just a short time ago uh, just how everything really does need to fit so seamlessly together and it has uh, somehow Harold Ford. I heard I heard President Clinton say something uh, during the earlier part of the week you may have heard it as well Reverend Sharpton and Willie he said you think about the great champions uh, of peace and those who were martyred in the 20th century for their short lives and what they contributed to after their lives and you think about Nelson Mandela and we celebrate him because of his life. You think about the Kings, the Kennedys, the Gandhis. You think about uh, what, how he lived his life and how he conducted himself and how he provided a model for leadership for uh, leaders all across the globe. Uh, really a remarkable life. And I, I tend to share your sentiment, uh, uh, Reverend, that we may not see 
an individual not only uh, treated like this at his funeral in our lifetime, but someone more deserving uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a life tribute like he's receiving. You know, I, and I think that, that we shouldn't gloss over quickly uh, what uh, you quoted President Clinton saying, because one of the many things that I think showed the greatness of Nelson Mandela is he lived a long life and never undermined the greatness of his life. Right. You know, sometimes we could all wonder what would have happened to certain leaders had they lived. He lived to 95 right. and yeah. never undermined the greatness and the level of achievement that he did, which is very difficult to do, because sometimes we see people at their peak, and as they get older, they tend to undermine the things that we admire. Yeah. In the tradition that you and Joe and I come from, we would say amen. Uh, it's Bill Clinton. At uh, least Joe and I would. Exactly. You know, I uh, just we're going to be waiting for the president to speak. We're going to get to other news, but real quickly, um, thoughts on uh, the fine balance, the uh, symbolic nature on many levels of hearing from President Obama. I think that the symbolic value is that uh, what Nelson Mandela fought for, building a rainbow nation. Uh, is represented when uh, Barack Obama, the President of the United States, stands up there, a young man who started his political and policy career marching as a foot soldier around anti-apartheid and now comes as the, as the head of the free world. I think it's, it's befitting, it shows achievement and something that I think uh, Nelson Mandela would be most proud of. And I, I've got to tell you too, I love the pictures of the presidents over there bringing both parties together. George W. Bush, a man yesterday we were talking about, who actually, as a president, did more for Africa That's right. than any other president. That's very, very uh, fair point. Which is a legacy, part of that Bush legacy that you don't hear, but you have three presidents down there in George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, who uh, I think represent us very well, especially on this continent, Willie. Yeah, ab absolutely. And. Um, you know, you go back to the relationship that Mandela had with all these men and how personal it seemed for all of them. When the President Obama came out on Thursday and made his statement in the briefing room, when we learned of the death of Nelson Mandela, you could see how personal it was. Sometimes they come out or they put out a statement and they say, we're saddened by the loss of, of foreign leader X, but this man meant so much to President Obama on a deeply personal level, not on a diplomatic level, but and, on a personal and, level. And as you see them talking right there, all, all of those presidents did All mean in one so shot, much. Hillary Clinton, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, yeah. <laughs> uh, standing in the rain it's all in, the um, in Soweto at the stadium where uh, Nelson Mandela is being remembered by tens of thousands from around the world. And you know, it was interesting, Reverend Al, that even uh, during the Iraq War, when the United States approval ratings were dropping, everywhere else in Africa they were steady and going up again because of the renewed focus on the struggles especially AIDS in Africa that George W. Bush and a lot of people put on that country. Uh, no, no there's no doubt I mean obviously you and I have all that views on Bush but it's, yeah. it's not disputed that George Bush did a lot around AIDS in Africa more than any president around AIDS we can argue about other issues and I think that it that the uh, fact that the polling numbers didn't go down in Africa, even though Mandela openly opposed the war in Iraq. And so, by the way, there are some quotes that uh, I saw BuzzFeed, uh, Andrew put it up on BuzzFeed, some quotes of Nelson Mandela uh, over the past decade that were conspicuously absent on American media. Uh, because he had some extraordinarily harsh things to, to say about the United States uh, during during that time. Yeah, he did. He, he really came down on a lot of American policy, and he, he uh, was very much, uh, in my opinion, adamant about things that I don't know if it would be harsh. I think he was right. But uh, some kind of well, way. Well, you missed don't agree with all the things that he said. Well, uh, sure. I I'm, I'm, I'm probably have to review them. But I, I think in this day of a memorial, we respect that Mr. Mandela had very strong opinions that many of us that are progressive uh, right. uh, would, would agree with. Okay, we're going to be following this uh, beautiful memorial service uh, throughout the morning. We're going to take the president's remarks live, which could happen in the next hour or so, maybe even less. We're waiting for one more speaker, and then the president will come to the okay. podium. Uh,
But now some other news. Republicans on Capitol Hill are bracing to push a last-minute budget deal through Congress before their winter recess. Congressman Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray are reportedly close to striking a small deal that would avoid another fiscal showdown, yet far from the grand bargain some were hoping for. The proposal would not reform entitlements or tax loopholes and would do nothing to address the rising federal debt, but it would replace some of the sequester cuts. Tomorrow is the last day the bill could be filed in the House setting up Congress for a Friday vote, which could also limit the amount of conservative dissent. Congressman Mick Mulvaney points out, quote, I'm resigned to the fact that fiscal conservatives always lose at Christmas. Well, that's not exactly accurate. We also lose all the time at Easter as well. True. They, our leadership will pass, like, will pass horrible things. And then they'll say, we dare you to stop everybody from going home for Easter. There's we that. stopped them from going home from Easter in 1997, and now I know why. That's really hard to I thought do. they were okay with the sequester. I, I, I'm confused. Well, Will the, I the, trade? The, the, the cuts, the budget cuts. Yeah, I thought they were uh, for are, that. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially on defense, are getting a lot, uh, a lot tougher. This, oh, right. This, this go around. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, going on with the quote, will I trade a dollar worth of sequester savings today for a dollar worth of mandatory savings 10 years from now? No way in hell. That being said, would I trade a dollar's worth of savings today for four or six or eight dollars of savings in the future? Yeah, maybe. Harold, the, the, what conservatives are bothered about here, but I think that's going to pass, but what they're bothered about is Paul Ryan and Patty Murray are saying, we're going to add extra money now, but we're going to take care of it 10 years from now. You know, in the out years, and we all know that never, that never comes to fruition. So conservatives are getting ready to get rolled. I think this is going to, I think this is going to pass, but this is a familiar. doesn't stop them, doesn't stop the people at Heritage from being frustrated. Like I was frustrated when people, if you want to talk about saving money, save money in the next two or three years, because if you go 10 years out, those cuts never come. Well, we've seen this play over and over again, and if you are not close to this or follow this um, like some of us around the table do, um, you have to wonder why can't they just reach a compromise? It's obvious Republicans want entitlement cuts and reforms, Democrats want a little more revenue. Why can't they come together and reach some agreement like adults should? The fact that we're celebrating this uh, milestone, if we can call it that, between Murray and, and, and Ryan, yeah. is, is very representative of where we are, not only in, in Washington, but where adults are in Washington and trying to get things done. So, I, I, look, I like, I don't like, it's, they haven't gone far enough, but I like the fact that we're not going to face the crisis that we faced just a few, few weeks ago. Uh, and as a Republican, I'm th as a Democrat, I'm thankful that the fellow you just put up whose quotes, I'm thankful he's in the minority position because we, we don't want to go back down the path we were just down several weeks ago, not for the Republican Party, for that matter, the country. Well, I think Republicans are tired. Uh, of, of, of what happened. They don't want to repeat of what happened before. At the same time, we're very worried about a $17 trillion debt. And we're very worried about the fact that even as the deficit drops, long-term debt obligations explode. But you're different. If you were there, you'd be trying to work out a deal. I think the, the, li listening to that comment, I think is representative of where a lot of Tea Party members are who seem to be uh, recalcitrant, seem to be unwilling to give a little bit to get something that they may want in the long term. I, Your approach is different I'm than his. I'm not exactly sure uh, what, what his approach is, but I'll tell you, what, the, the, what's, uh, the lunacy of all of this is that Medicare and Medicaid is what explodes and 20 years from now takes up every dime of our revenue. And we've got to figure out a smart, humane way to take care of people who retire 20 years from now so they have Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. All right, in and Texas, this ain't doing it. In Texas, there's a new Tea Party favorite hoping to join Ted Cruz in the Senate. Yesterday, Congressman Steve Stockman announced he will challenge incumbent. Steve Stockman. Yeah. I know Steve. I came with Steve in 94. Okay. He's the guy that like brings Ted Nugent to okay. State of the Union address. Well, for... he's going to challenge incumbent John Cornyn in the state's Republican primary for U.S. Senate. Stockman yeah. was not expected to do this. He withdrew his bid for re-election in the House and declared his candidacy just before the 6 p.m. filing deadline. The congressman says he's running because Senator Cornyn, quote, undermined <laughs> Ted Cruz's fight to stop Obamacare adding, it looks like Cruz was right and Cornyn was wrong. If you disagree with someone, that's fine, but I really believe you should do it privately, not 
so publicly. He made a big show of removing his name from a letter supporting Cruz. He needs to be held accountable for his decisions, and we look forward to a vigorous campaign. With the Republican primary three, stop smiling, with the Republican <laughs> primary three months away, Cornyn holds a significant advantage financially with seven million cash on hand. Stockman has about 32,000. Well, in this own ongoing intramural war, Willie, I don't think this is a wise move for a guy. I'm, I'm sure the concern, uh, the Tea Party people didn't tell him to run. Right. But here's going to be here's going to be another example of another race that the quote Tea Party candidate lost. Right. You know the last from the Alabama special, which a lot of Tea Party members said, "Hey, that guy wasn't one of us. That guy was a member of the right. Kook Party." Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, but I don't know. Yeah. It, it's amazing that. The idea that Senator John Cornyn is not serving. <laughs> oh, my Lord, I know. Uh, it's just not a yeah. uh, plausible argument. Well, let's see I mean, how that goes. You make, and it's, it's Steve Stockman's right to run, and if he believes that John Cornyn's not conservative enough, we'll He's see got what that the voters right, think. Let the voters Of vote. course, yeah. absolutely. But I mean, his case that John Cornyn is not a quote, real conservative, not conservative is pretty enough. Uh, and, you so know, I, Cruz refused about six months ago to come out and say that he would support uh, the reelection efforts of John Cornyn. So, that's a, that's now what does that mean, given the argument? Anyhow, uh, yeah. former Vice President Dick Cheney looking ahead to 2016 and the prospects of New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. I think Chris is a, is a uh, promising figure. I don't uh, agree with him on a lot of things. I'm more conservative than he is. Chris Christie's got to do a lot of work to, uh, to earn the nomination, just like anybody else. And I think we do need to focus first. Do you think he'll blow up on the campaign trail and his temper I, will blow him up? I, I don't know. No, I've, uh, I don't know him that well. I had lunch with him once. Uh, I've watched him operate. I'd, I uh, wasn't a fan of the way he welcomed Barack Obama to New Jersey when the hurricane hit. He said he had to at the time. Well, he was, he was the governor of New Jersey, and, and uh, he was doing what he thought was necessary. You think so. he overdid it? Uh, I would have preferred, uh, I, I don't know that he had any other choice, frankly, in terms of doing what he was supposed to be doing and what he needed to do for the people in New Jersey. Uh, but just like all of us, you know, we carry what we've done in the past around with us. That's part of our legacy. And uh, you've got to be able to explain it and support it and, and get people to understand if you want them to support you in the future. I don't understand. Yeah, he do wasn't mean? a fan of, of what he did in New Jersey, right. but then in the same it. sentence he said he had to do it. Why did he say anything, and why didn't he just support him? Well, I don't I think get it. Because he's the greatest Mr. Vice, Vice President. President of all time. Okay. And I thank God that was, was that was a dog President whistle or something. But and I think sometimes he does he help your party? That we don't. Does he help Cheney, right now? Right now, is he helping? That wasn't very helpful. You know what? I, yeah, you know what? It's so funny about Dick Cheney. The press paints him as like a demon, and he had low approval ratings. I'll tell you what. A lot of Americans were like me. They were glad that Cheney was there after 9/11. Does he help your party doing that, though? I, we could. We well, could, how does that hurt? Not, how does I, that hurt? I, how does that? What, what, what did he say that would hurt our party? Well, his approval ratings don't. I mean, if, if indeed he becomes the face of the party for 2016, Who? or uh, Cheney, or becomes somewhat well, of the face. Cheney's not going to be the face of the. No, party. but if he's the voice and he's representative of where he's the party. Not going to be the voice. He went on Fox Business News. <laughs> Okay. But if he's All the saying, elder statesman, right, if he's it, the one you have to get blessings, if he's the one that stands up there and has to evaluate the Christies all the way across well, the Well, listen, board. I, you know, the thing is, I'm... Look, I'm a Democrat. I'm not the I'm one I'm asking biased. you. I'm So I, I'm not the guy to answer this question. I like Dick Cheney a lot. I, I, so do I. I love it. But that lo was speaking out of both sides of his mouth. 30 years, and so I'm the wrong guy to ask that question. I think, though, this is what I would love. I would love to have a party where Dick Cheney's an elder statesman, and Colin Powell's an elder statesman. And you have, well, that's what we had, you know, when we won 49 states. We had, we had both wings of the Republican Party. And I'd, I, I love listening to Dick Cheney. I'd love to but he was have speaking Republicans out of both sides listen to a little of more mouth. of uh, Colin Powell. Well, I, th I think that if the party did that, that uh, it would help the party. Right. Uh, but when you have a party of Stockman and Cornyn, it, it only makes me go get the popcorn out and smile. Well. And, and, uh, and you need someone like him I to be keep clear projecting Stockman and positive. And Cornyn, that's your party. Did you not? Did you not see the Democrats yesterday? They were fighting like bobcats on this set. We I were, missed really? that. We were talking about a story yeah. about Democratic I infighting, and then they deny there's Democratic fighting, and then Howard Dean and Steve Ratner they fought 
lot like bobcats. And that makes me sadder, Willie. I don't understand. And we talked about this. That's why Harold You won't let me speak because you know I'm right. Nothing <laughs> makes me sadder. Okay. And Beckham, too, than watching Democrats fight like that. Yeah. Except so, we're but, sitting back with a Slurpee and popcorn, <laughs> applauding <laughs> as the whole thing. So what I out. just saw was the former vice president speaking. I, I like him very much. You can say that. That's a great <laughs> disclaimer because we do. He's a great but guy. Um, that was something, there I was something dishonest about him, that. But I like it. <laughs> I, I, what? There was what something dishonest. Come you on. Are so, He's a politician. You are so clear. You were, it is so easy for you to criticize the president vigorously. Vigorously, Have you been and to use Twitter? descriptions of you know things oh, that he yeah. said Mika, that are fuck. You know, why, why can't my, you my, my call problem, a spade a spade? Mika, my problem really has been, has it not, that I haven't criticized Republicans on this show? Is this what you're suggesting? No, I mean that was just. Is this what you're suggesting? Chris Christie I can doesn't give you a deserve a long laundry list. Republicans can give you a long laundry but, list of Republicans that I have attacked on this show for being dumb. That's just much ado about nothing. You, you talk about dog, well, you see Dick Cheney and just go all crazy. I think you kind of have a crush on him myself. I think you kind of like him. I think you like that strong, forceful guy, kind of a daddy figure. I think you like Dick Cheney. Ooh. I think there's some acclaim Should I stuff. punch him? I think you used to yes. drive past there yeah? in your, you know, in your Rolls Royce and you're having some Grey Poupon and you'd say, roll down the window here and you'd look up at the Cheney household and you go, that's a powerful oh man. God. He's just... Wow. Yeah, what do you think? that Anybody? just went off the rails. Anybody? You think what just, that's what, it? what just happened, Willie? Willie, what do you think? I'm not sure we just went there. <laughs> yeah. No, I think she has a crush on him. I've I really do. I do like him very much. See there? But that was speaking out of both sides. You lost me when the Rolls Royce. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, that's it. My mom drives a white pickup truck, so it really doesn't make any Can sense. Can I ask him? And it's a really old question. one. Like, yeah. What's Matt Lauer doing, Willie? Over. I saw some Fu Manchu thing yesterday, and. Get a He's got the full beard. beard. When is it? When is it? When's he take it? He kept off? it. Why? He kept the beard. He had a bushy beard, and he t he knocked it down to sort of like a. Did that make him? Do you guys know good. John Podesta's back? Under my stash that I had. Do you want it makes him look frail. Do you need to cut it. I'll pass on the. Ha I can pass do. that on and, and, and pass on the grooming advice. Has 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 Louis Bergdorf taken that ugly thing off? Oh. That's the one we really need to focus on. Yeah. No. Yeah. He's. He's, hey, um, TJ, has Lewis taken that thing off his he's face? He's jumped the shark, actually. He has a mustache. No, it goes like this. He shaved that. Oh, did he? It's just a yeah. mustache now? <laughs> yeah, just a mustache. Okay. Look at Alex. He just shaved one side up. Alex hey, knows I'm very mad. I hear him. John Podesta's back in the nest. Yes, looking, uh, I don't know. I'm just looking to get his administration uh, back on track after the que que questionable rollout of Obamacare. The Are president. You about Dick Cheney? Yeah. <laughs> the president has convinced a close ally to return to Washington. The New York Times reports John Podesta has agreed to serve as counsel to President Obama for one year. Podesta led the president's transition team in 2008 and has advised the, advised the president from the outside um, ever since. He also served as Bill Clinton's chief of staff for three years, but now Podesta will be in charge of bringing credibility and focus back to the Obama administration. Recent polling shows 53% of Americans think President Obama is dishonest and just in four in ten think he can effectively manage the federal government. Podesta will reportedly help with issues related to Obamacare and other executive actions. I think that's a great idea. Juliana. I Ju Juliana, I, I I think uh, it's what people have been, especially Democrats on the Hill, have been clamoring to get people back into the White House that have experience. Juliana, that looks like a great step. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think if you look at the other news that's been trickled out over the past 72 hours, you have Phil Shaliro, who's coming back to Washington from living in New Mexico to help oversee the implementation on the policy side of, uh, of the health care law. And now you have John Podesta coming in. He's going to take a counselor role uh, overseeing health care, climate issues, executive actions. And one thing you hear a lot from people, uh, a criticism often of this White House, is that there are so many smart, experienced, people who just want to give advice and they're so insular that they close themselves off uh, to that kind of advice and Podesta is really positioned uh, to provide that look when you see Jeff Zients coming in Phil Shaliro coming in these were all former Obama administration officials so they were already sort of part of that inner circle Podesta he's maintained that independence being 
but part of the Obama orbit, but not directly inside. And so he's going to be able to bring that perspective, those fresh ideas, uh, and the experience of having worked in a, a crisis mode at the White House uh, and been around for a really long time. And that's something that's really missing in there right now. General Ford, tough I think slog. I personally, I mean, I think that for the, the president, I think that this is a great move. I think this is a smart addition. You bring an experienced deal maker to the White House. Yeah. As we talked at the outset of your show, one of the, 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 the shortcomings and, and deficiencies in Washington is that there seems to be an unwillingness on the Democratic side and Republican side to find agreement. Podesta understands government works best when it works. And the only way you make it work is that you, work is that you achieve results. And everybody's got to give a little to get where they're going. And so I knows, applaud the move. He knows all the players in Washington. And you know what? Republicans, and a lot of them know him. Republicans like me. I mean, we've been around through the Clinton wars and everything else. You know, he's always on the other side. But man, I like him. And he likes, you can tell he likes, likes people. And Reverend Al, you need that when you're making a deal, whether, you know, you're in the church if, if you're or whether you're on forward. Capitol Hill or in the White House. If you're going to move forward and the president now is trying to establish his legacy and salvage the, uh, whatever has been tarnished of his legacy, you need a guy like Podesta that yeah. can move the ball. And that's not a hard ideologue. He certainly is on the president's side of the column in terms of the political debate, but he's not inflexible. And he has good personal relationships. So at this yeah. stage, I think it's a good choice. Pretty critical. We're going to go back to Soweto, South Africa, to the stadium where, standing in the rain, tens of thousands of people are celebrating the life of Nelson Mandela. You can see they're waving flags, dancing in the stands. It's not really mourning, but more a celebration of his life, and the music has certainly symbolized that. President Obama is due to speak any moment. You see him getting ready there. Uh, we've heard from Nelson Mandela's grandchildren. We've heard from someone who served prison time with him. We've heard from members of his family and uh, world leaders from France, from 90 countries, including several uh, former presidents of the United States, are on hand to celebrate Nelson Mandela's life. And now President Barack Obama will take to the stage and will remember Nelson Mandela himself. We're going to take his remarks live uh, as he greets people and makes his way to the stage. Um, this moment is so poignant because, of course, the president spoke of his personal connection with Nelson Mandela uh, moments after he died uh, over the weekend at the age of 95 years old. And Juliana, Willie Geist was talking about how uh, the White House reacted after Mandela's death. It wasn't just, it, they didn't just paint by numbers. You could tell that this really was a very personal connection that President Obama felt with Nelson Mandela. Yeah, that's right. I think of all the speeches that the president has given on a personal level, this is probably the most important for him. And it's my understanding uh, that he spent a lot of time on his own crafting the speech and thinking about it. Uh, look, when we were in Africa in June, we were waiting for any moment to get word uh, that Mandela was pass has passed away. He was gravely ill at the time. And so this is something the president has been thinking about, obviously, for years and years. And, and what a moment for him uh, mm. to be essentially eulogizing his personal hero who really inspired his own political activism who he didn't really know that well. They just met one time. They spoke a few times over the phone, but they are so bound by history. And Reverend Al, you were just talking before about the problems that uh, Barack Obama was having right now. Uh, Mandela, as Mandela said, uh, time and time again. He made mistakes. He was a sinner. But the bigger picture of Mandela, the one that my children and your children and our grandchildren will, will, will read about and know about, will look at the remarkable place in history he has. And I have a feeling that 50 years from now, very few people will be talking about Barack Obama's struggles with <laughs> Obamacare, but instead talk about the remarkable historic place he uh, he has in the United States of America's history. No, I think you're right. I think that, uh, you know, the gauge, a lot of people uh, always use the adage, what will it matter 100 years from now? And I think that all of the infighting, all of the attacks that uh, Nelson Mandela went through 
uh, doesn't matter in the span of history, and the same will happen with Barack Obama as president of the United States. And I think that's what he will speak to this morning at uh, the funeral of Nelson Mandela, where he places in history, where he places in terms of the curve uh, of where we saw a nation that was divided and split based on race and based on uh, other factors that really undergirded apartheid and where it is now and that Nelson Mandela helped to get ahead of that curve and bring that country forward. And the all, all of the other stuff doesn't matter. And I think that's where leaders on that stage have to try to govern for. And he's on that stage now about to eulogize a man that uh that the whole world will be talking about for so many years to come. Um, it's, it's, Willie, I heard you talking about how quickly time has passed there, uh, how Mandela was in prison not so long ago, and now the scenes uh, in a town that, uh, where white people didn't go. Uh, it's, it's been a remarkable transformation, and it's been a remarkable transformation for our government. Bobby Kennedy in 1966. Uh, went to Johannesburg and he had his own State Department and uh, had his own Justice Department and had LBJ enraged that he would go speak out against apartheid. Uh, the United States has been on the wrong side of this issue for a very long time. They just announced the president. Uh, but now you have the president of the United States uh, stepping up to address the crowd in memory of this great man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. To Grasa Marcel and the Mandela family, to President Zuma and members of the government, to heads of states and government, past and present, distinguished guests, it is a singular honor to be with you today, to celebrate a life like no other. To the people of South Africa, in his life, and your freedom, your democracy, is his cherished legacy. It is hard to eulogize any man, to capture in words not just the facts and the dates that make a life, but the essential truth of a person their private joys and sorrows, the quiet moments and unique qualities that illuminate someone's soul. How much harder to do so for a giant of history who moved a nation toward justice and in the process moved billions around the world. Born during World War I, far from the corridors of power, a boy raised herding cattle and tutored by the elders of his Bembu tribe. Madiba would emerge as the last great liberator of the 20th century. Like Gandhi, he would lead a resistance movement, a movement that at its start had little prospect for success. Like Dr. King, he would give potent voice to the claims of the oppressed 
racial justice. He would endure a brutal imprisonment that began in the time of Kennedy and Khrushchev and reached the final days of the Cold War. Emerging from prison without the force of arms, he would, like Abraham Lincoln, hold his country together when it threatened to break apart. And like America's founding fathers, he would erect a constitutional order to preserve freedom for future generations, a commitment to democracy and rule of law, ratified not only by his election but by his willingness to step down from power after only one term. Given the sweep of his life, the scope of his accomplishments, the adoration that he so rightly earned. It's tempting, I think, to remember Nelson Mandela as an icon, smiling and serene, detached from the tawdry affairs of lesser men. But Madiba himself strongly resisted such a lifeless portrait. Instead, Madiba insisted on sharing with us his doubts and his fears, his miscalculations, along with his victories. I am not a saint, he said, unless you think of a saint as a sinner who keeps on trying. And it was precisely because he could admit to imperfection because he could be so full of good humor, even mischief, despite the heavy burdens that he carried, that we loved him so. He was not a bust made of marble. He was a man of flesh and blood, a son and a husband, a father and a friend. And that's why we learn so much from him, and that's why we can learn from him still. For nothing he achieved was inevitable. In the arc of his life, we see a man who earned his place in history through struggle and shrewdness and persistence and faith. He tells us what is possible, not just in the pages of history books, but in our own lives as well. Mandela showed us the power of action of taking risks on behalf of our ideals. Perhaps Mandela was right that he inherited a proud rebelliousness, a stubborn sense of fairness from his father. And we know he shared with millions of black and colored South Africans the anger born of a thousand slights, a thousand indignities, a thousand unremembered moments, a desire to fight the system that imprisoned my people, he said. But like other early giants of the ANC, the Sisulus and the Tambos, Madiba disciplined his anger and channeled his desire to fight into organization and platforms and strategies for action so men and women could stand up for their God-given dignity. Moreover, he accepted the consequences of his actions, knowing that standing up to powerful interests and injustice carries a price. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I cherish the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die.
Mandela taught us the power of action, but he also taught us the power of ideas, the importance of reason and arguments, the need to study not only those who you agree with, but also those who you don't agree with. He understood that ideas cannot be contained by prison walls or extinguished by a sniper's bullet. He turned his trial into an indictment of apartheid because of his eloquence and his passion, but also because of his training as an advocate. He used decades of prison to sharpen his arguments, but also to spread his thirst for knowledge to others in the movement. And he learned the language and the customs of his oppressors so that one day he might better convey to them how their own freedom depend upon his. Mandela just demonstrated that action, and ideas are not enough. No matter how right, they must also be chiseled in the law and institutions. He was practical, testing his beliefs against the hard surface of circumstance and history. On core principles, he was unyielding, which is why he could rebuff offers of unconditional release, reminding the apartheid regime that prisoners cannot enter into contracts. But as he showed in painstaking negotiations to transfer power and draft new laws, he was not afraid to compromise for the sake of a larger goal. And because he was not only a leader of a movement, but a skillful politician, the Constitution that emerged was worthy of this multiracial democracy, true to his vision of laws that protect minority as well as majority rights and the precious freedoms of every South African. And finally, Mandela understood the ties that bind the human spirit. There's a word in South Africa, Ubuntu. A word that captures Mandela's greatest gift. His recognition that we are all bound together in ways that are invisible to the eye. That there's a oneness to humanity that we achieve ourselves by sharing ourselves with others and caring for those around us. We can never know how much of this sense was innate in him or how much was shaped in a dark and solitary cell. But we remember the gestures, large and small, introducing his jailers as honored guests at his inauguration taking a pitch in a Springbok uniform, turning his family's heartbreak into a call to confront HIV-AIDS that revealed the depths of his empathy and his understanding. He not only embodied Ubuntu, he taught millions to find that truth within themselves. It took a man like Madiba to free not just the prisoner, but the jailer as well. To show that you must trust others so that they may trust you. To teach that reconciliation is not a matter of ignoring a cruel past, but a means of confronting it with inclusion and generosity and truth. He changed laws but he also changed hearts. For the people of South Africa, for those he inspired around the globe, Madiba's passing is rightly a time of mourning and a time to celebrate a heroic life. But I believe it should also prompt in each of us a time for self-reflection with honesty, regardless of our station or our circumstance, we must ask, how well have I applied his lessons in my own life? It's a question I ask myself.
as a man and as a president. We know that, like South Africa, the United States had to overcome centuries of racial subjugation. As was true here, it took sacrifice, the sacrifices of countless people, known and unknown, to see the dawn of a new day. Michelle and I are beneficiaries of that struggle. But in America, and in South Africa, and in countries all around the globe, we cannot allow our progress to cloud the fact that our work is not yet done. The struggles that follow the victory of formal equality or universal franchise may not be as filled with drama and moral clarity as those that came before, but they are no less important. For around the world today, we still see children suffering from hunger and disease. We still see rundown schools. We still see young people without prospects for the future. Around the world today, men and women are still in prison for their political beliefs and are still persecuted for what they look like and how they worship and who they love. That is happening today. And so we, too, must act on behalf of justice. We, too, must act on behalf of peace. There are too many people who happily embrace Madiba's legacy of racial reconciliation, but passionately resist even modest reforms that would challenge chronic poverty and growing inequality. There are too many leaders who claim solidarity with Madiba's struggle for freedom, but do not tolerate dissent from their own people. And there are too many of us, too many of us on the sidelines, comfortable in complacency or cynicism, when our voices must be heard. The questions we face today, how to promote equality and justice, how to uphold freedom and human rights, how to end conflict and sectarian war, these things do not have easy answers. But there were no easy answers in front of that child born in World War I. Nelson Mandela reminds us that it always seems impossible until it is done. South Africa shows that it's true. South Africa shows we can change, that we can choose a world defined not by our differences, but by our common hopes. We can choose a world defined not by conflict, but by peace and justice and opportunity. We will never see the likes of Nelson Mandela again. But let me say to the young people of Africa and the young people around the world, you too can make his life work your own. Over 30 years ago, while still a student, I learned of Nelson Mandela and the struggles taking place in this beautiful land. And it stirred something in me. It woke me up to my responsibilities, to others and to myself. And it set me on an improbable journey that finds me here today. And while I will always fall short of Madiba's example, he makes me want to be a better man. He speaks to what's best inside us. After this great liberator is laid to rest, and when we've returned to our cities and villages and rejoined our daily routines, let us search for his strength. Let us search for his largeness of spirit somewhere inside of ourselves. 
And when the night grows dark, when injustice weighs heavy on our hearts, when our best laid plans seem beyond our reach, let us think of Madiba and the words that brought him comfort within the four walls of his cell. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishment, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. What a magnificent soul it was. We will miss him deeply. May God bless the memory of Nelson Mandela. May God bless the people of South Africa. That was President Barack Obama capturing the legacy of Nelson Mandela before a celebratory crowd of tens of thousands of people. He spoke of Mandela's legacy of reconciliation, of inclusion, of struggle. The president saying, Michelle and I are beneficiaries of that struggle. He also spoke of the struggle that still lies ahead. He called Mandela a great liberator and President Obama saying he makes me want to be a better man, Reverend Al. I thought it was a powerful address by the president. He recounted the struggles. He recounted uh, how uh, Nelson Mandela had to rise above uh, the adversities, 27 years in jail, mm. and yet uh, he was not afraid to compromise. He was practical as much as he was visionary. And I think the president made it clear that we have not arrived yet. We still have to deal with issues of economic and racial inequality in our world and he challenged those world leaders sitting on that stage don't just memorialize mandela but do what mandela challenged us to do i thought it was a great address i think he did not just get caught up in the drama of the memorial he right. challenged the leaders of today to let's be about it not just talk about it today and go home and ignore the continuing inequality in our own nations I I thought it was a powerful message.